Uh, well, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Um, I did an interview a couple of weeks ago with my partner, Pam. It was so successful, I've asked her to uh, do it again, except I'm going to be asking her the questions this time. Uh, so let's have a go. So I've been on, it's really my almost my theme at the moment, is to get away from dualistic uh, 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 thinking about things and, and either or, and only one thing can be true. And I remember back to 30, four, almost 40 years ago, a friend gave me a copy of the book, uh, The Turning Point, I think that's what it was called, by Fritjof Capra. And back then it looked really uh, hopeful that we were looking at something called systems thinking. And uh, of course it hasn't come to be, and that might be part of the reason why we're in the big bloody pickle that we're in at the moment. So I, Pam, I'd just like to get your thoughts because you had some really excellent things to say. So if you can remember it uh, and just share it with us, that would be great. Hello. Um, yes. Well, thank you, Robin, for the um, for the intro and I totally agree, you know, when we're looking at complex situations happening in the world today, whether politically or environmental, climate change, you know, I do think that sort of people in my generation are conditioned to think in a dualistic way. And when I think back to my university training and it was – it was it was rather that way, and it really wasn't until I was well into my middle years that I was fortunate enough to attend some leadership um, training sessions with some really excellent, I have to say, top notch facilitators from I think they were from the US, and I just remember being really kind of buzzy about this systems thinking because. Well, you know, you know what it's like when you meet something for the first time and you just know it to be true, and it's like, oh, of course, it's sort of saying what I've always thought or, or known, really, but um, certainly not, you know, what 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 we were doing when I was teaching secondary school. I don't think we were delivering the teaching from from that sort of thinking framework. So yes, it's a it's been it's an interesting model, and thanks for the chance to have a bit of a a look at it again now in this interview. Ah, oh, okay, that's uh, that's uh, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, please continue. Well, I remember on the first day of the the first workshop that I did in this model being asked to get into groups and play this game. And I thought, oh, no, you know, <laughs> bloody hell, game. And I think it was called the beer game. And we all had different roles. And it was a sort of scenario about trying to work out why this company was going under, why wasn't it doing well. And everybody had a role to play from the salesperson at the one end to the producers to the, to the customers and – I've never forgotten it really because as we worked through it and we each played our role, we realised that the problem that or the, the mistake that we often make when we're trying to solve problems is that we hone in on a particular solution before we've actually really looked at the whole system, which takes some time. And in this case, this, this scenario, I think the um, – producers of the booze decided that the way around it was to produce a lot more and put it on the market so that they but actually it wasn't the solution at all it was it was something completely else that had they seen it they probably would have saved the business and saved themselves and so you know that, that model aside it made me very conscious of how complex inter, and interrelated ecosystems are you know in the natural world and there's really a simple cause and effect solution. For example, 
to a predator-prey relationship. So in New Zealand, we have a tremendous problem with introduced predators because we only had two land mammals on, living on the islands when humans arrived here. One was a bat. Actually, that was, yes, and the only one, and the other one was a marine mammals out in the ocean. So, you know, when humans came with their rats, cats, dogs, and everything else, all hell broke loose and many critters became extinct. But even today, there's a, there's a kind of, if we kill, get rid of the rats, then this will happen. And what I learned was that there are always consequences to, to every sort of step that you take and um, they can be negative or they can be positive. And I remember the instructors on this course talked about beneficial and negative feedback loops. And feedback loops is something that I've heard you talking about a lot, Robin, with Guy McPherson and others when you're looking at what's happening in, in you know, the, the climate, the changes that are taking in global climate system how one thing happens and it triggers a whole lot of un, unpredicted change, you know, feed, feedback loops, which sort of amplify the speed of change. I could say more about that, but I, I think I'll give you another question that might help to pinpoint me a little bit more before, could, before I go too far off track. Yeah, thank you for that, Pam. Uh, it reminds me of a quote, which uh, I think it comes from Einstein, who says, "Yeah, you know, a sign of madness is is doing the doing the same thing that you've done always, and then expecting different results." That's a good example, Robin. That quote that you've just said, and it reminds me of that wonderful quotation again you know you can't change the system by the, the same level of thinking that created it and that bringing brings me to a model that I found very useful and I, I continue to find very useful so thinking of you know the causal relationships if you do this then you get this our training recognized it was a simple framework that that it was a discipline really about um, how much, what was it you were actually looking at? Was it a simple or a complex situation? So if it's a simple situation, like I suppose my tap's not working and the water's flowing out of the tap and it new, needs a new washer, that probably that cause-effect relationship is reasonably predictable and repeatable. So I get the plumber in and they replace the washer. And if it's best practice, it'll be a good washer that'll last for a long time. If it's a cheap plastic one, it won't. So that's, if we learn from that, we'd say, well, we, we need to use good, good washers. Then we, we move up. And this is where in my professional life, as a conservation educator, I saw a lot of people getting stuck. We come into the complicated realm where what I do, or the, the, the effect that I'm seeing and the causative factors that led to that are not immediately recognised. You know, they're not sort of simultaneous, but we can research the relationship and, and know it fairly, with a fairly safe level of, you know, confidence. So that gives rise to what I'd call good practice. So, you know, we know, we can safely say that in the majority of situations where this is happening, these causes happening prior to the event, uh, we can safely say that. And so we come up with some practices or some solutions, if you like, that are pretty much able to be applied. So that that's sort of all good and well in a very predictable world, right? We can safely predict. But what I found fascinating was when we moved into the sort of consideration of whether the past would actually able us to predict the future, you know, and how much complexity is there. So the cause and effect relationship doesn't repeat and it's it's unpredictable. And I've often known this when we're dealing with situations to do with with natural disasters or particularly, I suppose it's very topical, isn't it, with global warming. 
you know, the, the climate's getting hotter and hotter and it's very complex because of the all the, the many, many interrelationships and the feedback loops and so on. And what I see happening a lot is that, and yet a, a sort of a, a problem-solution mindset gets applied to that complexity. And so, you know, hell on, billions of dollars get in, invested in solutions, right, we'll do this, we'll suck the carbon out of the atmosphere with no kind of real cognizance of what that might mean and what else it's going to unleash you know, you, you would know more about the context of climate than I do, but I'm just giving an example. And in that field of when you're dealing with complexity, and I've always loved this, we're not looking at best practice, we're looking at emerging practice. What's emerging from this? Oh, wow, you know, we didn't quite expect to find this, but this is great. Let, let's explore this some more. And I've always personally found this a very um, compelling place to work it kind of suits my my mental space really you know because I know we are dealing with complexity but but things always arise from that whether you're talking about groups of people working together and the dynamics in a team or what's happening in you know in a climate system I'll just hand this back for a moment yeah uh, that uh, sort of brings to me the whole question of causation because you know we have this idea of causation that a causes b and that causes c it's very kind of linear but i remember again uh fritjof capra i think it was is in the Tao of physics and he talks about in terms of quantum mechanics i think he, he talks about local connections which is obviously what we're talking about here uh, or, or, or sorry, the you know the, the people that practice kind of that sort of thinking do, but then there are non-local connections between things. We can sometimes see the connections, but often, and perhaps even the majority of cases, uh, we don't. Indeed, um, and. We could bring that right down to our own health, could we not? Absolutely. You know, and the health of the people around me. One of the one of the sort of things that's been both bothering me and annoying me lately is, I suppose, the realization that we really are dealing with a sort of culture that's pathological, really. You know, and 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 we talked with friends the other day about how you know, medical models that just become so pharmaceuticalized. You, you know, you go to the doctor and I'll try this and if this doesn't work, try something else. And it seems to me, and it would to you, Robin, you've worked in the natural health area as an acupuncturist, how complex each one of us is and how rare it is to consult with anybody who can just sit back and listen really carefully and say, let's try this and see what happens, which would take you more into that we're dealing with complexity here, so we're not just going to do the same old. Does that tie in at all with what you just said? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it does. And I mean, I don't really mind what limited worldviews people have. Well, I do, actually, because it has an effect on all of our lives. But, you know, in ordinary conversation. But uh, what really bothers me is that these people are becoming very militant and they're trying to tell us that uh, uh, unless you follow their very limited worldview, then there's something wrong with you. In fact, it might even be worse than that. I mean, you might be, you know, I don't know what epithets they want to use, but yeah, <laughs> that's how I feel. And of course, if we looked beyond the medical model or the system to the wider economic capitalist model that it, that it's sort of derived out of, you know, we would we would realize how how complex, you know, all the, all the different levers and drivers that are are leading to this sort of adherence to this 
pharmaceutical model to health that we now have. Like I'm thinking in my own country, New Zealand, there's currently a law before our House of Parliament to legalise the use of marijuana and it's complex and, you know, not, not a straightforward yes we will or no, no we won't. But already what I can see creeping in around the edges is, you know, marijuana is something that people could, um, if it were legal, as it is, I believe, in Canada, grow or and, and in the state of Canberra in Australia, you know, you, you could, if you wish to, cultivate a very small amount of this herb for your, for your own use. Um, but suddenly it's becoming... Big business, and I really wonder whether big farmer is going to farmer is going to take it over. In fact, in a way, they have, haven't they? Because we've got this whole swathe of is it um, synthetic marijuana? Am I right? That's that's available, and what's horrendous side effects? And but it's all money that's driving that. It's people wanting to maximise their profit from what's actually a plant growing in nature, but it's being made into something that's going to put it out of the reach of the people who most need it, I guess, and uh, make some other people very rich. So what's coming to my mind, Pam, as you say this, is how ubiquitous, I mean, this, this kind of impinges on every aspect of our life and, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which way you turn. And as you're saying this, of course, the whole question of uh, vaccination comes to mind. I mean, it's a hugely uh, complex issue, but you, if you hold a dissident view, you literally can't talk to anybody about it. You know, you'll be shouted down. You, They don't want to allow you know, to send your kids to school and, 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 and so it goes on. And yet there can be, you know, perfectly good reasons for, uh, you know, for saying that vaccination, especially of small children, is not a good idea. Yeah. Yes, that, that's, I, I, I agree, Robin. It's a, it's a good... Um issue, isn't it? And goodness only knows what these sort of multiple vaccines are doing to the very, very young children, you know, being forced or whose parents are being forced to have their children vaccinated if they want to send them to school. Yes, but um, getting back to the to this framework where we start with a sort of simple causal effect, you know, cause-effect relationship, relatively straightforward, and then something a bit more complicated where good practice emerges. This is what's worked well in the past. Then we're in the complex domain. What happens, where do we go from there? Something's very complex and we've moved beyond that sort of parameter of the predictable world and we're now in an unpredictable world, which we are today in many, many ways What's the next kind of quadrant in this framework that you would think if, if things spill over from being complex into somewhere else where there's no cause-effect relationship that we can see? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to uh, – what, what – you know, to uh, to say to answer that because I don't think that there is any answer. We're just in the realm of the unknown, and I don't think that the uh, answer is either going to be well. It might be simple, uh, but it's not going to be very nice. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we're in the realm of chaos, which, in a way, I mean, if if, if you were looking at it purely as a kind of I don't know, philosophically, you might say, well, this is actually quite sort of exciting and interesting. And haven't some of the astronomers talked about chaos and chaos theory? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I've never I've never really understood uh, chaos theory. But anyway, uh, do you have more to add to this? Or 
just just a little bit. Um, that in the training that we did, we were talking. We we applied it to the realm of, you know, communicating with each other and working in teams. And one of the attributes, I guess, of teams or or of people working together who who really were um, capable of breaking through those sort of thought boundaries that kept them chained to the past was just the ability to listen really deeply and to not come in with even with any hypotheses, deep listening and not knowing, you know, being willing to work with the uncertainty can give rise to some really novel thinking and practice that that doesn't arise from us just bringing our old sort of thinking processes w- with us. Yeah. Do you know what that speaks to in, in my mind? It speaks to uh, exercising, uh, just allowing the mind to go completely silent and uh, just seeing what what arises. You do the work, you do all the mathematics, you do all the measuring, you do everything that you need to kind of in the objective sort of sense. But then at a stage, and I believe this was the insight of Einstein, how he discovered uh, relativity, was in the end, it's just, it's an intuitive thing. You do everything that you need to do and then you just go silent and then maybe the answer will come or maybe it won't. Yes. That's a very, yes, sort of rare place, I think, for for most of us to to be comfortable with, but it's, but it's such a powerful place and, and we, we could be, I think, having the courage to to do this more, you know, with each other, not just in, not just when we meditate, but but think of, you know, bringing that to groups of people um, working together. And also not, not being afraid of making mistakes. In fact, somebody called Thomas Watson, it's a quote that I really like, he says, would you like me to give you a formula for success? It's quite simple, really. Double your rate of failure. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite, it's quite neat, isn't it? Because it, you know, when you, when I hear that, it opens up. I, I take a big deep breath and it, oh, good, I can relax, which sort of, you know, brings me to that wonderful thing of safe to fail experiments. And I think when we start to play in that sort of space, it's really interesting, and and it, it does open up new ideas and possibilities that we mightn't have thought about before. I think kids are really good at this. It gets conditioned out of them. Yeah, well, I often, uh, I use the word uh, often, uh, you know, I'm engaging in a thought experiment. And I think, uh, you know, it's just sort of come to me recently, but I think really we would be better off if we threw out our ideologies and and started just listening deeply and uh, and 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 uh, conducting thought experiments anyway that is absolutely fascinating and it's coming it it's saying really what you know what my approach is but you know just from a slightly different angle so uh Thank you very much, and I hope this will be just as interesting to our listeners as it has been to me. So thank you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Back from a walk with you, and you had something very important, a very important observation about this. So can you just tell us what you were saying? What I have noticed in the years that I've lived in the Hutt Valley and walked along the river embankment, is that after heavy rain at any time of year, 
when I've walked along the embankment, there are always a lot of earthworms washed out of the grassy banks and they end up on the the sealed walking tracks. And I mean, I've noticed them and lots of them get squashed. Sometimes I actually pick them up and put them back on the grass so they can burrow back into the earth. But of late, I have noticed after heavy rain, and we've had quite heavy rain recently, that I, I'm not seeing that. Those worms are not there along the path as they used to be. And I thought about that in the last couple of days. And it occurred to me, well, hang on, this is this is the cold season. So if I'm not seeing them now, what what's it going to be like in summer when it gets really dry? So it's just one little observation that adds to a sense of a drying out of our groundwater. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think that uh, that, um, uh, that anecdotal evidence is so important because I don't really believe that the research is uh, going on. Uh, but you've noticed something else, uh, and this is sort of related to climatic things, and that's just, uh, I mean, if you... If I put the microphone on what's happening in the garden right now, you wouldn't think so, but there seems to have been a fall off in the number of birds, and you came up for with uh, quite a, a credible reason for that. Yes, I think there's a, a fall off. I'm seeing it in the number of common garden birds, and it's related to different things I would say including a kind of a shift in the season so food that would be available for them at certain times isn't there if the ground is drying out and the worms are harder to get then that's going to affect you know birds like the blackbirds and thrushes that dig those worms up and I mean I'm not even looking at the predator issue that's there's that that's going on all the time in the background was there anything else that I noticed and haven't mentioned well, no, that's quite enough on its own. Uh, anyway, yeah, so that was a very important thought, Pam. <laughs>